Okay, so it's Saturday Splatter Day at Romford Horror Film Festival. Um, my name is Peter, I'm part of the festival team. I'm delighted to be joined on stage by five legends of not just horror but cinema overall. I'm just going to introduce them all to you first. We have Ian McCulloch. Yeah. We have uh, Tinsia Monreale. Uh, we have Pauline Piet. <laughs> Caroline Monroe. <laughs> and Marianne Morris. <laughs> so some of you have been to the festival before, and some of you are here for the first time. First time. First time, first all the way time. from Italy. First time. Uh, and Marianne, first time. First time, yes. Yes, yes. and Ian, yes. yes. And uh, Pauline and Caroline, you were with us last, last year. Last year, yes. 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 So whether you're returning or it's your first time, you're very welcome. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you to you too. So um, as part of my research, as part of doing this, I kind of looked to see how many of you had actually been in films with each other before. And apart from, I think, if my research is correct, Pauline and Caroline, you're in a new film together, which yes. we may cover later. Yes, yes. yes. But apart from that, I don't think any of you have actually been in a film together, the same film. No, 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 right? no, 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 sadly no, but no. there's still time. Yes, yeah. that's yes. Yeah. In the well, same yes. studios, but... Yes. No. Different productions. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, well, I can say that I was supposed to be in a film with one of these delightful ladies on my left. Um, I did a film called Contamination, for Contaminazione in Italy, and the director, Luigi Cozzi, wanted one of these ladies on my left to be uh, the leading lady of the whole film. Um, unfortunately, um, Sergio Leone, was working in America and he met a French Canadian actress um, and insisted to Luigi Cozzi that instead of using the lady on my further left to do the part, he got this uh, Louise Marlowe, she was called to play the part. But originally, if any of you saw the film Contamination, the leading lady and star of the film was going to be Caroline Munro. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Uh, we're already. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. And to work with Luigi again. Yeah. We both worked with him, mm. and he was a joy to work with. Beautiful man. Mm. Yeah, so uh, oh, wow. several of you worked oh. with Luigi uh, Cosi. Uh, several of you worked, of course, with Fulci um, and some other directors and some other crossovers. But uh, the most, the, the greatest connection that I actually found between you, uh, Ian, Pauline, Caroline, and Marianne, you all worked with one actor who I found in my research. Does anyone want to guess, maybe? First hand went up here. Who's the one actor? Who's they... Bella Lugosi. No. No? No. No. Any more guesses? Follow me. Stan Laurel. No. <laughs> <laughs> what was that guess up there? Correct. Yes. Oh, well yes. done. Yes. So yes. Well four done. of you yes. all worked at one point or another with Peter Cushion. Yeah. So yeah. I thought maybe we could just start off with maybe an anecdote or a memory or any kind of thing that you maybe want to say about Peter Cushion. Marianne, do you want to start first down the end of it? Peter Cushion was an absolute gentleman. He was so soft and so considerate. And at that time, it was one of the very first parts that I had. And I played the part of a nurse. And he obviously realized that I was a newbie. And he came and spoke to me and asked me, you know, what I'd done and what I hoped to do. And I was playing at the time a part of a nurse. And he said, oh, I think you'll make a wonderful nurse. And I said, well, I hope you never need me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Yes, it's a lovely story. <laughs> it's a lovely story. And yes, I absolutely agree. He was the mm -hmm. sweetest gentlest, most giving man and actor that I think one of them that, that I've ever worked with. He was a joy to work with. I, I did two films with him. The first film 
I never quite get this right. It was either Dracula AD 72 or Captain Cronus, but I think um, uh, the, the Dracula AD, I, I did, um, uh, no, I didn't have any scenes with him, but he was in the film, and Christopher were my main scenes. Um, and the other film wasn't Captain Cronus, it was um, At the Earth's Core, which I got to work with him for six weeks. There was the three of us. There was um, Doug McClure, American, yes. the Virginian. I remember him. And a wonderful actor. Yes. And mm -hmm. what, a, what a character, too. And then Peter and myself, and we were like the three musketeers. And yeah, it was the best yeah. film to, to, to work on with him. And he was so clever, because what he used to do, um, he played a rather eccentric, um, uh, like an engineer, but he, we, we were... We went into, we burrowed under the earth for this wonderful film. And, um, and he was sort of the engineer that put it all together. And uh, Doug McClure was the, you know, the, the kind of macho man. The, the, yes. And I, I played a princess in the beginning, in the middle of the earth. So Peter, he turned up the first day. And what he did, he brought props with him. Oh. He was so he was known as the prop man. He'd bring things with him to give him characters. And some of the film was to fight off these creatures. These, if anybody's seen the film, they'll they'll see. Mm -hmm. He used his umbrella, and he got the umbrella. He said, "Look, Caroline, look what I've got." I said, "Oh, that's nice." I said, "What are you going to do with that?" He said, "I'm going to fight off these fiery beasties." <laughs> and this is what he did with his umbrella. Yeah. Always wore white gloves. Yes, yes, yeah. so, yeah. yes. yes. Yeah. Extraordinary man. Yeah. Total Lovely. contrast to Christopher Lee. Very different. Oh. Chalk and cheese. <laughs> yes, but they, much yeah. so. they had so much very respect much for so. each other. Yeah. Yeah. They did. Uh, no, uh, I, rights of Dracula, right? My scenes were not with Peter or Christopher, but the first day on the set, he, um, he said, come along. You don't have to worry about anything. You'll be fine. And, and then he went off. And I felt comfortable. I felt good. I thought, yes, I'm going to be OK. And at the end of the scene, um, he said, I told you, you are fine. Now go and do something else. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my encounter. Yet still, I had met him quite a few times out at Bray or at Elm Street, but never doing a scene together. So he was lovely to me. He was so, oh, he was warm. He was generous with his time beforehand. And I will always remember that. So I enjoyed my time and I enjoyed uh, that film as well. He had a quick wit, too. He was very funny. He could suddenly say something, you know, out of the blue, and, and, and he would ad-lib a bit, you know, which I love. I like a bit yeah. of ad-libbing. And he, he did that. He'd suddenly come up with a line, and, and, he, and then Kevin Connor, the director, said, yes. He said, we can use that. Yes. And, and so they did. So, yeah, very special. Well, I mean, I first sort of knew of him. I mean, it was mainly as a stage actor, because, I mean, not many people are aware of it, but at one time he was sort of talked about as being a, a successor to Olivier. He was so good on stage. Um, and uh, he's in Hamlet, with the Hamlet that Olivier did, and I think he plays Osric. Um, but there are lots of people who say that he actually stole the scenes that Osric are in with Olivier, and stole the scenes from Olivier, and Olivier wasn't very, very pleased about it. <laughs> but I first met him on a personal, a, a mutual friend um, lived in Whitstable, where as you probably know, he set up his home, and I was invited to Sunday lunch, which he cooked for the four of us. Um, and what amazed me about his house was that it was full of miniature theatres. And it goes on a little bit what Sir Caroline was saying about being an inventor or an engineer. I mean, he made miniature theatres of all the principal older theatres in London. I mean, and they were all dotted around his sort of sitting room. I mean, they were and stunningly, you know, lifelike and absolutely exact. Um, and he also said, probably the thing that astonished and worried me most was 
that he went swimming in the sea in Whitstable every day of the year, regardless of the weather. That he just because I think wow. he lived on the coast, Nippy. but he went out and he immersed himself. I mean, I wouldn't even get in a hot bath in Whitstable. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, that's what he did. And then I had the good luck to work with him in on the Ghoul, uh, where, as the others are saying, he was just he was just an absolute gentleman and. Uh, there aren't sort of many of them around still, and there weren't actually many of them around when we were sort of doing that. But he was very kind, he was very, very considerate, I and mean, we knew his lines, knew everything, knew what he had to do, thoroughly respected the director, even respected the producer, which didn't really deserve being respected. Um, <laughs> but he also, at that time, he had lost his wife, and as it's in lots of publicity, he used photographs of his wife on stage to reminisce about this sort of lady that who vanished from his life, and uh, and what he said at Whitstable was that he wanted to die uh, because he wanted to join his wife. Mm. And after that, I think he still had ten years of his life to go, including making the ghoul uh, with me. But that that was th the one thing that he was really looking forward to. But I say, I mean, a, a fantastic man, and I mean, a, a giant, and sad in one sort of way that he sort of got stuck, I mean, I know profitably, financially, but sort of got stuck in this genre because he was a lot bigger and better than most of the films that he ever did. Of course, he did Star Wars, didn't he? Yeah. He did Star Wars, so that kind of took him right up again with the young people, which was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Let's um, talk about modern horror, maybe talk about the genre. I know some of you are not fans, um, I'm trying to remember now which ones of you. Uh, you are, you're, yeah, that's right. So Ian uh, and Marianne, you're definitely not. It's definitely not. The genre. No. Too gory for Too me. Too gory. Yeah. <laughs> Too graphic. I think I much prefer the imagination. Mm. And I think things, because of the way things are filmed and the fact that obviously it's CGI and um, AI is coming into it, the feeling and the spirit of a film is lost because the horror sometimes it's what in the imagination but now it's too graphic in my in my opinion yeah i mean you were all in films at a time where the horror was very practical mm -hmm. very yes. diy very very real and now cgi i agree with you that cgi now doesn't give you the same depth and the same punch as, as real kind of you know effects and it I'm, does I, go I just on I just, I just don't like getting frightened. I mean, I, I, I get frightened <laughs> enough seeing myself shaving in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it takes, True. it goes on and on and on. Don't you think uh, uh, murder scene, uh, people don't think about killing someone and then spend a long time thinking about picking up the knife and that, it just yeah. goes on and on and on and on and on. And you think, in the hammer days, it would be a knife, that's it, done. And you saw it, that's the thing, because everything was done practically before your eyes. Mm -hmm. I just remember lying on the altar with Christopher Lee, or Christopher Neem, actually, and then they'd, they'd stuck a, sounds rather odd, this, <laughs> but I was wearing a shroud and uh, they'd stuck a pipe it was very clever because I thought, how are they going to do it? They stuck it up my um, shroud and then they... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still in jet lag at the moment. Sorry about that. Um, yes, so what they did, they stuck it up the shroud and then they had this goblet on the top. And what they did, there was a man lying on the floor and they pumped the blood up through the thing and through the shroud. So yes, I was trying to say that, and yeah. I didn't do it very well, but, you did but very it was all well. done practically. Yeah. And then you could, it helped the actor too, because everything was done, and you could actually feel the time. tension. Yeah, it in was done time. in real time. Mm. And we couldn't do another take with that, because I was covered <laughs> in Kensington gore, so yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Chintzia, um, do you enjoy, uh, do you watch uh, the Fulci films, or the films that you're in now, do you still watch them? Do you watch them back today? Uh, if I'm watching again uh, yes. the movie of Fuji. Yes, the ones you were in. Um, <clears throat> yes, sometimes I, I watch again mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the movie Fuji uh, in, the, in the cinema when uh, I invited uh, in some part of the world, uh, in Copenhagen, for example. And um, 
it's, uh, it's funny to review the movie because uh, the new public is uh, every time a new, a new film, a yeah. new, the same story, mm. but the, the public, mm -hmm. the audience, yes. uh, make the film uh, uh, in, in some way uh, new, mm -hmm. because the, the glance, mm -hmm. the regard, Yes. Is, is new. Yeah. Mm. A new experience, yes. Yeah, yes. and uh, I, I feel what the audience uh, feel in that mm. moment. So, mm, uh, is uh, every time something uh, fresh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That um, was the answer. I sorry for my English. English. No, it's beautiful. It it's sounds okay. so yeah. pretty. And we hear you, we understand. Yeah, 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 yes. 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 Thank you. It's beautiful. So, um, Marianne, what do you think is the last in appeal of films like Vampires that you were in? You know, we're here at a horror, con you know, horror day, horror convention, lots of people come to see you, to meet you. Yeah. What do you think it is about those films that it's lasting all this time? I think they were in a genre of their own, and they don't make films like that anymore. Mm -hmm. And the audience that are quite often attracted to these films um, is almost like a history lesson to them because they're seeing things which aren't made that way anymore. And also, I think people are, are, you, are too knowledgeable. You can Google everything. You can find out about everything and horror, etc. And everybody's an expert. But people used to come to see a film like um, Vampires because it was exciting, it was different, and it, it was very, very visual. And I think the visual part of it is a big, uh, big thing. It didn't have a wonderful script. Because it was visual, the part of it, what they saw was what they got. But you just don't, it was at the end of the Hammer Horror films. And uh, that, that in themselves, they're wonderful films to see now. But everything has gone too far the other way, too horrific, or too mild. As I say, you know, the nearest thing you've got to it is Midsummer Murders, which oh. is a very mild <laughs> version. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Plus, they have a lot of money now to mm -hmm. spend yeah, they on do. their films. Sure. That's true. Our films, they didn't have that much, and they didn't have months and months and months to do it. They had six or eight weeks, and that's it, done. Mm -hmm couple of takes, if you're, lucky, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, without question, hour, that's it, one take, and um, it's over. And you had sure. to know what you were doing. So we don't have the luxury of, at the time, for months on end. And unfortunately, they, they spend a lot of money in graphics and all that, and mm. really not enough time delivering mm. or making you use your imagination or think, hmm, he's going to do this, I'm sure he isn't, but then they don't do it. You're expecting a scene and for something to happen, but it doesn't. So it leaves you in suspense. Well, they're franchises, a lot of them, and they yes. leave you in a sort of an area of suspense. Mm -hmm. And if it does well, there's a, something leading you can on pay to another it. £12 to see the next one. Yes. <laughs> more. Uh, more, but, but also, I think if you look back, and the budgets we had back oh. in the day were minuscule, really, but the, the expertise that the crew and the, yes. the set designers and the costume. You think of all the wonderful technicians we had mm. back in the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, the films looked beautiful. They were beautifully shot. They had the best directors. They had some great actors. So I think, you know, I think they're very underestimated in a way. And that's why I think a lot of the people are here because Hammer and, you know, Italian films. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I worked in Italy quite a lot, but, but they had just that certain something that looked fabulous. Yeah, and as you say, maybe the scripts weren't the best, mm. but they looked a treat for the they eye, were. and they had the intrigue and the slightly erotic and the music too, and beautiful oh, music, yes. Yes. music, yes. absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm just sort of agreeing with what uh, Cynthia said about um, the sort of generational appeal. I mean, 
I made, um, what was it called, zombie, ho zombie flesh eaters. Zombie flesh eaters. God, the mind's gone completely. Um, <laughs> but, but I made that in 79. Um, and I say it just keeps on coming out again as a new DVD, as a Blu-ray, as a 4K. And it, say that's three generations of, that it's, a, it's appealed to. So something of that era, and in particular done by that same gentleman, Fulci, has a resonance with people who are now in their teens and people who are now in their 60s. And um, what it is, whether it's storytelling or these fantastic sort of, um, sort of professionals who are helping them with the sort of camera and the sound, and in our case especially with the sort of special effects, uh, just sort of resonates you know, over nearly 60 years. I mean, mm -hmm. it is, I, I personally think, peculiar to the gent that we both sort of work for, although it obviously sort of works with some of the other ones from the Hammer time. But the, the, the longevity of, of the Fulci stuff is, to me, absolutely amazing. I mean, thank God, because otherwise it wouldn't be here. Mm. That's great. Mm. Um, so you touched on people like Fulci there. I was going to ask one more question, then Mark, I think we're going to open it out to the audience. Um, we talked about Fulci, you talked about some of these other directors that you worked for. Can you all think of maybe one director that you would have loved to have worked with but never had the opportunity to? Yeah. Well, well, this this is right out from left field. Um, it's a Scottish television director, actually, called Moira Armstrong, who I thought, has anyone ever heard of her? Yeah. I mean, who was just absolutely stunningly brilliant at everything she sort of did. Anything and everything she sort of put her hand to it was absolutely brilliant. Um, and I did a series with her called The Borderers, which she sort of directed, uh, which died a death, thank God, because it was so awful. <laughs> um, but I, I made the big mistake and I think it stopped my career perhaps I shouldn't be telling you so and I think it stopped my career certainly with her was that we were filming um, just outside Glasgow and we were all locked out of the hotel and I climbed in through her bedroom window to open the door for everyone else to get in <laughs> but then I very deliberately stayed in her bedroom <laughs> and she gave me a very, very old-fashioned look, and I got out of the room as quickly as I could, and, <laughs> and I was never invited to work with her again. <laughs> <laughs> but that's... Uh, yes. Uh, Tizia, do you know someone, maybe a famous director, that, you, that you would like to have worked Stanley with? Stanley Kubrick. Ah, so. Oh, good choice. Yes. 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 What, and why? Why? Mm. Uh, uh, because I think that uh, uh, his cinematography is the most complete, uh, um, not only cinematographic sense, sense but uh, in the, it, he was complete in his mind. He could uh, uh, think about <clears throat> a lot of kind of question of life. He uh, made a movie, a perfect movie, about that theme, yes. Tema. Mm -hmm. yes. So he was able to uh, understand completely uh, what uh, he uh, would uh, investigate. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made uh, the... Uh, Perfect movie yes. uh, without uh, with technique uh, with uh, mm, uh, the choose of actors uh, the, mm, the 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 perfect image uh, in the scene uh, the symbols he investigate everything and uh, I think I think uh, know him. Uh, could be uh, a great uh, opportunity for testing uh, a real um, genius. So, great answer. I would like it. Okay. Yes, every genre. Basically, war, every war film, yes, sci -fi, because it's horror. not the question of genre. <laughs> it's the question is uh, what you have uh, in your uh, mind, in your heart, in your Art and in your art. Okay? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And um, the way uh, in uh, the way uh, what you want uh, to tell to to the people is uh, important. And uh, the way if you are uh, so big, such big artist, you can uh, find the way. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Pauline? Uh, filmmaker. Ken Russell. He used to, um, I met him, but I did not get the opportunity to work with him. He used to doodle on paper. And he would, you've got the script, he says, I've got the characters there, all that, but I want this little extra in it. And he would doodle things and he would spider chart them around like a and for me, it gave a lot, it said a lot, mm -hmm. and it enabled the people that I knew at the time working with him to have an in-depth of what he's trying to get out of you at the same time, even though you had your own input. Mm -hmm. And that to me was something I wanted to encounter. I wanted to have because a lot of my my um, experience was being on stage, and yes, I I wanted that very badly. But then I had no sex pleas with a British. There you are. Look at that. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, can I be greedy? And have two. Sure. Yeah. First old school would be David Lee. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, David Lee for me was quite extraordinary. The pictures he painted, the the stories he told. I mean, Ryan's Daughter to me still remains one of my favorite favorite films. How he got that, how he did that. I mean, I believe it was like pulling teeth, especially the storm scenes. I mean. People know that film, don't they? Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, that was just phenomenal. Um, extraordinary, I think. I, I, I would love to love to have worked with him. And now I come back to sort of 80s, it would be Quentin Tarantino. He's right up my street. He's right up my street. Never met him, but, but I can't, he's really out there, isn't he? Yes. I mean, he, 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 yes, his films are quite hard-hitting, very hard-hitting. But um, I just think he's he is a bit of a genius with with what he's storytelling and his ideas and again the way he shoots them is extraordinary. So he he would be a bit of a go to for me. And plus he loves the genre. You know he's a big big fan of this genre. So he would be a good one for me. Still time. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, David Lee. Not for, uh, no, not David Lee. No. He used to take the boat down the river. And then they used to point out to go to take my children when they were younger down the river to, um, uh, what is it called? Is it the, um, near the barrier down there. And they used to point out, and that is David Lean's house. So he used to go take the boat down the Thames and, and see his house and his beautiful garden. But, but sadly, no, not around. But Quentin Tarantino is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Never know. You never know. One never knows. Never know. <laughs> Now I'm going to be greedy too. Oh, <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock, who created the tense tension and also the mystery that the horror films I think carried on. I just thought he was a genius because he was so direct and although he perhaps isn't remembered for being the nicest person, I think that what he created and the films that he produced uh, were just absolutely amazing. And one of the last films he made was Frenzy, and that was filmed in Covent Garden in the old, where it was years and years ago. Now it's moved to Nine Elms. And really, the history's there, and uh, that was quite a, an amazing film, which I thoroughly enjoyed, amongst the others. And if I talk about somebody I'd like to work with, if they have me, is Martin Scorsese. Oh. Because to me, he is the attention to detail and what he brings out in the actors who are all so different. And you think you've seen it all before, but when you see one of his films, you haven't. 
And I think it's the, it's the, it's the art, the magic of the art, the genre, and what he creates. Wonderful art. So it's the old and the new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spencer, do you want to see if anyone has a burning question? Oh, I have a I'll see if you have a link to all that. There will be lots of questions out here. Put your hand up, Spencer, because I want to find you. Come up. Don't be shy. Why is everyone shy? <laughs> oh, no one's got any questions. At the front. I was just here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought anyone else had questions. Uh, so do you have any fears for the future of the way that cinema is going with like AI and stuff like that? Worrying, isn't it, really? Yes. I think a little bit. I don't know, certainly in Hollywood. They've, they've had a problem with it, haven't they? But I think they seem to have got it sorted out. I suppose it's the way it's going. They call it progress, but I'm not sure about that. It's cloning art. It's yeah. Going, yes, yeah. and art surely has heart, yes. really, at the end of the day. It has to have heart and feeling and, and human touch, I think. But they're yeah. also the one with the money. And they make the decision. And it makes it difficult. So the actors has to go along with it and put up with it. If they, I would say, if they had too much to say, they would be discarded. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe there's a fear in Hollywood. Maybe yeah. there is. I mean, I think that's what the fear was. That there was a whole strike, wasn't there, to do with that? So I, I don't know. I suppose it's. It's everywhere, isn't it? So, yeah. But it's everywhere in life, too. But, well, so I was going to say, but, 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 you know, art is art, and our, our profession is our profession, but if AI takes over sex, then humanity's doomed, isn't it? So yes. Uh, Bye, yeah. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Cheerful Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, we've got a question. Oh, here we go, here we go. Oh, no, we're off now. Oh, what more questions for you? Can make last questions. Um, my favourite series with Ian has got to be Survivors when he played Greg. And when I was a kid, he was definitely one of my heroes. So uh, just a, a question for, for Ian. How did you get involved in Survivors in the first instance? And also, have you still got those very special boots in the series? <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I first, the answer to the first bit, um, I did, uh, I was having a really rough time as an actor. Um, and then my agent said, uh, You've got uh, someone wants to see at the BBC about an episode of Colditz, and uh, the part is for a very, very public school head boy type captain of every sport, heroic figure, who when he gets into Colditz, everyone puts him on a pedestal, loves him, and thinks he's the greatest thing since sort of toast, um, and and just go along and just be as nice as you can. So I went in to see this direct, director called Terry Dudley. And I did all those things. And when I was bounced in, I was doing all funny, made silly jokes, was a bit of a silly ass. And then at the end of it, he, gave, he pushed a script towards and said, well, the part, part's yours. Um, these are the dates. And I was obviously pleased. And then I looked at it, and it had a totally different title and a different author to the part I was coming along for. And it was the part of a cold blooded shit. And everybody hated it. And people wanted out of cold as soon as possible, because he was so awful. <laughs> so that's how I got Colditz, and because of Colditz and um, that one particular part, the same director produced Survivors, and he, uh, a year later, asked me to do that. The boots, I mean, I, in, I don't know how many of you actually remember the series. Um, I, my ch you were allowed to choose your own clothes, and I chose an anorak made by a firm called Tenson, and I thought, as this, and I wore it every day of the film, I thought, the firm in Sweden who make this are going to pay me an awful lot of money for wearing it in nearly 30 episodes shown all around the world. And I didn't get a hate me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I flared jeans with the Vogue then, and I deliberately wore very, very tight jeans. Uh, thinking it looked better. The only problem was that it made me bloody difficult to get on a horse because my knees wouldn't bend because the jeans were so tight. <laughs> and although you don't see it in the series, I had to be lifted onto a horse every time. <laughs> <laughs> but the boots had a sort of checkered career because I, I specifically chose those boots and they came close to killing me because I kept them, I was, gave all the other stuff away for sort of charity auctions, but I kept the boots. 
and I was in South Africa and I was riding a horse which I thought was an ordinary horse. In fact, it was a race horse that had been trained for a specific race two days later. And it was really, uh, it was an uncut stallion as well. And I was riding this and it just ran away with me. And I was wearing my boots and I couldn't turn it. Normally if the horse is running away, you try and make it turn in a circle, a big circle, it gets the circle getting smaller. There was no way. There were all these little black children around local schools tearing through it at a sort of galloping pace and I couldn't stop it, couldn't turn, couldn't do anything. And then I thought, well, I've got to get off this bloody horse. And I tried to throw myself off the side and these effing boots stuck in the stirrups. And I couldn't get off the horse. And I was dragged for 200 yards through a wood by this horse with tree, you could see the steel of the horse's hooves coming up as I was being dragged along. Um, I broke two ribs and fractured my collarbone. And then right at the end, I pulled my foot out from the last sort of stirrup and I got rid of the boots straight up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No. Hello there. Um, quick question for Caroline. Um, one of my favourite films as a kid was Star Crash. <laughs> and I just wonder, isn't it crazy there's a world that exists where you're in a film with David Hasselhoff and Christopher Plummer? <laughs> and how unlikely did it seem at the time, or did it just feel quite natural? Um, well, I couldn't say it felt natural, exactly. It was an extraordinary film because Christopher Plummer came along at the very, very end after, um, you know, after we'd been filming. We were in Chinichita Chinichita filming Star Crash. Um, and uh, it was an extraordinary experience working with Luigi. So, um, yeah, David Hasselhoff had just come off, and I'm not sure he'd been filming in Los Angeles. I think it was The Bold and the Beautiful or The Young and the Brave, one of those big American series. And, and, and so I, I, I met him the first day I arrived. And um, I thought, wow, I, I didn't know him. I didn't know him, but, but I, got to, I got to really like him. He's quite a very charismatic and quite, quite a crazy in a way, but in a good way. He's a, he was good, and he was so excited to be doing this film. It's his first feature film, so um, he's very excited. And, and I was too, you know, to be doing this, thinking I was going to wear a space suit and and this, that, and the other, and this wonderful flamboyant um, uh, costume designer came, he was wonderful, he was Italian, and, and very camp, let's say, and he was fabulous, and he bought these two strips of stuff, and he said, Caroline, he said, no, I want you to wear, I'm very, very bad, at <laughs> 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 excuse me, but, um, uh, but it, he said, you wear this, and I said, Oh, I wear it under the spacesuit. He said, no, no. He said, you wear it, you just wear it. Just this. <laughs> and that's it. So I wore that. So that was getting used to that. And then towards the end of the shoot, this wonderful, wonderful Christopher Plummer came along. And that was kind of, you know, they'd been waiting. And I think Luigi had been waiting for, um, to get a big star. And then there was Christopher Plummer. And he, he's, Luigi said, we only have him for two days. He said, and we're shooting direct sound. I said, what do you mean you're shooting direct sound? What have we been doing the last four months? Have we not been shooting direct sound? He said, oh, no, no. I said, we have to get this right, you know, Christopher Plummer. So, so yes, it was a joy to work with both of them. Christopher Plummer was charming, so sweet, and so fabulous. I mean, he was the emperor of the universe, so that was quite the um, quite inspiration, I must say. Yeah, I had great fun in Italy. I love Italy. It's such a beautiful place, Rome. Beautiful, beautiful place to work. Yeah, Thank no, you. I did. <laughs> great time. Got any other questions out here? Hold him again. Hang on. I'm going to. Oh, right. Come on. <laughs> 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 right. Suspense. Oh, Thank you so much. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, panel for their uh, fascinating uh, reminiscences and, and thoughts. Um, I'm Sergei Sabotsky. My father was Milton Sabotsky, who was the producer of Happy Earth's Call. So I'm delighted to hear that mention. And, of course, his company, Amicus, was uh, Hammer's main rival at the time. Uh, and certainly in our family, we 
we think that there are different approaches to, uh, to the styles of horror, uh, even though there are a lot of actors who were in both uh, studios' films. So when we go over and over this and over from your own thoughts, I'd be really interested to know what you, how you would describe the differences between Abacus and Hammer films, and uh, up to hear your thoughts. Certainly working with Amicus, which was a joy, worth spending six weeks with Peter and Doug McClure and Kevin Connor. And John Dark was our producer, John Dark, who I believe did carry on. Yeah, yeah. did he yeah. do yeah. carry on? Yes. Yes. Did he? Yeah. Oh, yes. I didn't know that. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I think they were certainly my film, the, the, I say my, the, our film. Um, at the Earth's Core was more geared towards family audiences. So I would say it had a more family-friendly feeling, whereas The Hammer had more of a, I, I suppose young children maybe wouldn't have got it, you know, Hammer as much, because it was more, well, it was sort of more, more erotic, adult. more adult. Yeah, more adult, more, more adult. busts and yes. waistline. Lots of all that stuff going on compared to... <laughs> compared to, <laughs> yes. Whereas Amicus was, was more child-friendly, family-friendly. But, um, but they were both up there. I think they were both up there together, as far as I was concerned. You know, and I'm sure... I'm sure your dad would agree with that. Or maybe maybe they were just ahead of Hammer. I'm not sure. I'm trying to be subtle here. But no, both both a joy and both at the same time. I felt very fortunate to work with both huge franchises. So very, very lucky. Yeah. And you did too. Yeah. You worked with Amicus. They were excellent in different ways. It was different. It was um, a different approach. Same actually I think the crews did crossover. As far as I remember, some of the Hammer crews would also work with Amicus, mm -hmm. as far as I remember. It depends on who you had who was filming at the time. Mm -hmm. And if uh, naturally you want work. And yeah. so you would work with one company and when the next one saw they go back. I mean Pinewood Studios, we, we shot um, Earth's Core in Pinewood Studios. And we'd also done a lot of um, uh, Dracula AD at Pinewood Studios. So I, that's why I think the crossover happened. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Um, I've got one more. Uh, I've got a question. Yeah, I'll find it. Yeah, come on. Is it true what everyone says about Pinewood Studios? That's very, very cold in there. Is it true that Pinewood Studios was very, very cold? Yeah, yeah, as in the yeah, yeah, as in temperature wise. Okay. Yeah. Anyone want to it, it depends on, it depended on the set you were on and what you were doing and whether you they were going to take you. Sorry, it varies. There were it huge varies. sound yes. stages, yeah. huge, and to heat them up. And they tended oh, right. to, I think, not particularly heat it up because I think. You're maybe more on your game when you're a little bit, you know, a little bit. So it maybe. works for horror then, if you're shivering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shivering. Gets you in the mood, yes. Yeah. Like shivering. And some of the sets, they had um, blow torch like in the fire. And it, be, yeah. it warms you long enough to get what you need to do done. Oh, and oh, then wow. that's it. We had it yeah. at the Earth's core, I think, I swear to goodness, um, one scene where Peter, Peter Cushing, was... Uh, Doug McClure had come to save me from, from the various creatures. And the one scene, they said to Doug and myself, they said, do you want stand-ins? We have stand-ins for you. And we looked at each other and we said, no, we don't want stand-ins. We'll do it ourselves. And then, um, and then Peter was in there too with his bow and arrow. And there were these creatures at the bottom. I don't know if they were the Mayhars. They weren't the Mayhars, but they were creatures. And they were shooting, to talk about bolts of fire, huge <laughs> bolts of fire. You've seen your dad's film, sure. obviously you have. <laughs> it's huge yeah. bolts of fire. And, and so we, we, done, we blocked the scene and then they said, right, right, Caroline, uh, Doug, the fire's coming now. So the fire came and by goodness did the fire come. My hair was standing on end. <laughs> and I swear to goodness, you know, we were sort of singed. So the screams that happened were really real. But um, yeah, that is a memory I have very, so very good special effects on that one too. And uh, Pauline, you worked with Roger Moore? Is it Persuaders or Saints? Yes, 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 I did. And uh, Antonio Curtis at the time. Roger Moore was a lovely, lovely person to mm -hmm. work with. 
and he was down to earth. And as funny as it was on screen. Yes, it depends. It depends on whether he was doing the same to mm. or Ben Gordon and, and uh, the Persuaders. Mm -hmm. They were funny together. They were bad together. Right. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> very, very bad. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So, uh, is it time for one last question for myself? Yes. Yeah. So, um, what would one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Um, Marianne, do you want to maybe start? Yes, <laughs> I think the advice I'd give to my younger self, because at the time I was 24 years old, and the money that I earned over three weeks, if I put that in a pension pot, oh. <laughs> yes. 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 I would and, and not squander it, because at that time we were given information like, oh, you know, if you want a, a part in our film, I think, You've got brown eyes, I think you should have blue eyes, and so you squander things on optics and things like that, and the money just goes. But when you think back on it, in those days, you know, relatively speaking, if, you, if I know, if I knew then what I know now, I think I'd have had a different approach. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Carry on. Um, do you know what? I think, I think about it a lot, but when, when I did um, Dracula AD, I was coming in. And all the actors, all the actors had been to stage school and I was the only one that really had no experience. So I had to rise or fall, you know, watching. I'm, I'm a great watcher and a sponge, you know, I like to sponge and watch other actors. So, so I think maybe it might have been good to have had a bit of, you know, a bit of uh, technical know-how. I'm very much of the style of instinct. But then again, I think technical, if you can fall back on technique, I, th I think that would be kind of important, I would say, maybe. Hindsight. Oh, I would say, I would tell anyone who wants to go into this business to um, try and be themselves, keep themselves as they are. Don't, just because someone say, oh, you should do this, or you should jump into that, don't do that. Give yourself the time to see if that's the avenue you want to go down. Just Very continue true. being yeah. true to yourself. So many yeah, people like give you bad advice. Yes. And yes. 10 yes. years yes. down the road yes. you'll go yes. back. You're still you. And you will then be able to move on because you would have absorbed how other people work at the time. You would have taken in new things and enables you as a person to grow as well yeah. and that's what I would say yeah. beautiful good advice for life not just for yes, the film industry life, certainly yeah. um, I think that uh, the suggest uh, that uh, I would like to give to myself is that impossible for young people for young people, because uh, um, just is it reflect on what are you doing? But it is impossible because when you are young, uh, when I was young, I was in a, a flux of uh, of the life of work, job, and uh, I I. I was completely uh, in, in immersion, in full immersion of this kind of life, and uh, I I had no time to, to reflect on. But in any case, some case uh, could be important, but I couldn't. <laughs> What's the saying? The youth is wasted on the young. Yeah. Sorry? The youth is wasted on the young. The yes. same. I think it's very true. Yes, yeah. yes very true. Ian? Uh, well, I, you, you, you sort of asked me earlier what I, what, I, what I might say, and I thought, well, I'm going to say something really learned and sure I'm educated. Um, and, and I was going to quote Polonius from Hamlet, uh, but it's exactly the same that Pauline said, which is Polonius says to his son, to thine own self be true. And then was followed with the night, the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. So that's, that's the full quote, to, to thine own self be true. 
But quite honestly, at the end of it all, I think I could say was good luck. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. 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 you're the right face, Absolutely. the yeah. right place at the right time. Someone loves your face, someone loves your voice, someone obviously loves your body. But it, but it all, at the end of the day, it just comes down to that. And I honestly just, you know, talent obviously sort of helps, but the, it's the good luck. So I would wish all a young actor or whatever, masses of good luck. And to all of those of you who live in Essex, who had the heaviest rainfall for 400 years, <laughs> good luck to you as well. <laughs> <laughs>